Hey y'all, my name is Adina Barnett Miller, but I'm known to my students as Mrs. B. I've been passionate about West Virginia history for as long as I can remember, but my mom would tell you it all started when I was three years old and she bought me a West Virginia County's puzzle at Geno's Pizza. I've taught history in Ripley, West Virginia for over 20 years now, and I'm an adjunct professor who teaches college West Virginia history to high school students. Please join me for West Virginia History with Mrs. B, a field trip across the mountain state to walk in the footsteps of those who came before us. Hi y'all, it's West Virginia History with Mrs. B. Uh, we're coming to you from one of my favorite places in West Virginia, uh, Mate One, West Virginia, and we are at the West Virginia Mine Wars Museum. And I'm lucky to be joined by a friend of mine um, who's gonna introduce himself and give a little back background about him. Hi, my name is Lloyd Tomlinson and I am the, West, the education coordinator for the West Virginia Mine Wars Museum. What that means is I work with teachers and other different groups to develop curriculum, activities, lessons, and do museum outreach um, to teach people about the history that we have here. Yes, and we're getting ready to dive into some very exciting history. Um, Lloyd is a wonderful resource. He left out the fact that your PhD is in this very subject on yeah. mining history. Yeah, I'm finishing a PhD uh, focusing on industrial history in Appalachia. So come along, we're going to give you lots of information, we're going to show you the museum and talk about all the amazing things that you can see if you come down here to visit in May 1. Let's go. All right, let's do this. Um, very first thing, I mean, talk about something that will just hit you in the gut. The first time that I saw this, it took my breath away. Um, what are we looking at, Lloyd? So these check tags um, are things that the miners would carry with them in the mines. They'd hang one up at the mine entrance to let management know who was in the mines at any given time. And they would take one with them to hang on to the carts that they loaded up so the check weighman would know who to credit the payment to. And there's 361 up here. They represent the men that we know of who died in the Monongah mine explosion on December 6, 1907. And um, the explosion at Monongah um, is the worst mining disaster in U.S. history. Um, Monongah is a little community up in Marion County, and you can find some historical photographs of this time period. Uh, but the mine was a gassy mine, and, mm -hmm. and it just exploded. Yeah, at least 361 people died. We still don't have an accurate count. Yeah. And it wasn't just grown men either. A lot yeah. of the people who died were boys, and most of them came from um, the immigrant communities. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, Italians, Poles. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of immigrant population. And at this time, mining was different than we think of today, that everybody had a shift. Mm -hmm. You worked by yourself, and you made money off the coal that you mined yourself. Right. And so that's why... There were so many boys in the mine because they were working along with their fathers to provide a wage. Yeah, and they would also work as um, trapper boys working yep. the vents and making sure that there's airflow in the mines, um, working as breaker boys, right. making slate out of the coal chutes. Um, mules, they worked with the mules yeah, they too. Would care, they would drive the mule teams that were hauling the coal out. Uh, you'd see boys as young as nine years old in these mines. Yeah, absolutely. So this here um, is a map just to give you an idea of some of the um, coal camps um, throughout the southern coal fields. To give you an idea of where we are, we are right here in Mate 1. And so up is Red Jacket from here, um, just right up the road. We came through here on our way. So, but you've got Mingo. This is the Williamson coal field. You've got, here's Logan where we were. Here's Boone, here's McDowell. This is gonna be the number one coal producing county um, in West Virginia by 1911. Then you've got Raleigh County, Kanawha County, which th this is the part of Eastern Kanawha County um, towards Fayette County. And then you've also got over here into, that's Nicholas up there. So this is where all these coal camps at one time were. And we're still finding the locations of more and more of them. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. 
Alright. Look look at this picture. Oh, these are all breaker boys. Mm-hmm. I just can't even imagine. I think that's a photo by Lewis Hine. He was a labor activist in the early nineteen hundreds. And he took a lot of photographs um, that depicted child labor during what we would generally refer to as the progressive yeah. period. Yeah. Yeah, this is definitely, this is the progressive era. So people who think of like Teddy Roosevelt, uh, mm -hmm. then the, they, we were exposing the dangers of businesses and the poor practices of mm -hmm. businesses. So um, we've got an unknown coal miner here. You see he's got the old time before the carbine hat. And then here's another photograph as well. Well, here is some company script. Oh, too. yeah. This is a major importance. So, and then they've got each of the individual companies on there. And most of the times they have holes in them, mm -hmm. you can see. So you can tell the difference between script and um, yeah. U.S. currency. Yeah. Yeah, and like this is what most miners in West Virginia were paid in, and it wasn't usable anywhere outside of their company stores. Yeah. Um, some companies did d do a script buy, sort of a buyback program, but they would usually only pay at most about 75 cents on the dollar. Yeah. So yeah. it's not even worth face value to the company, right. and it's worthless outside of the company stores. Right. And sometimes it wasn't even a... Um, a monetary value assigned to it. We've got a piece over there next to that milk bottle that says good for one loaf of bread. Right there. That's so interesting. I've never seen one of those. Well, and I wanted to mention too, because this is something I always have to tell my students. It's script, not script. It's S-C-R-I-P. So it's not script. So I always like to point that out to folks so we make sure we get the pronunciations right so here this shows all kinds of stuff that you could have purchased at the company store anything interesting in here to point out Lloyd uh, one thing that generally confuses people um, about all the stuff that's in here um, those pieces of metal um, that are next to the straight razor. Uh, what do you think those are? I have no idea. Those are harmonica reed blades. <laughs> That's crazy, but that makes sense. Oh my goodness. But some of these items are homemade too. This is all stuff that you could have found in any coal camp house. Absolutely. Check out the Coca-Cola bottle. That's an old one. Wow, well, here's your hook for darning socks and things. Hat pin. All kinds of awesome things in here. Oh, I think this is really important. Yeah, the canary cages. Yeah. Um, in the early, early days of hand-loaded and mining, um, coal miners would bring canaries in these little cages with them and the reason they would do that is canaries are very very loud but they're also really sensitive to changes in the atmosphere particularly from like poison gas or anything like that so if there was a buildup of methane or any other gas in the mine the canaries would go silent or they might even die yeah so if, yeah the birds stopped chirping, the miners knew that they needed to get out. Absolutely. And a lot of miners did develop a little bit of an attachment and like a empathy towards these birds. Oh, I'm sure. What's your pet? Yeah. Um, and they were, they had even less choice than the miners did about right. um, their jobs in the mines. <laughs> exactly. Um, eventually, the canaries were phased out for special lanterns that the flames would change color if they hit a methane pocket. That makes sense. And they were enclosed, so there was less chance of igniting any of the right. other gases. Right, which is important to know. Um, coal mines are really gassy, mm -hmm. and so when you're wearing something like this with an open flame on your head, um, if you hit a pocket of methane, um, you're in trouble. 
real quick. So we're going to see headlights like that and then we'll show you the later ones and then eventually we get, you know, more of a flashlight kind of thing because you don't want to have an open flame um, in a gassy mine. Right. So, and here's another, this picture is old. This shows um, the mule teams that pulled the coal out of the mines. So before we had machines that they took into the mines, they had um, mules that did the work. There was an instance um, after a mine disaster, after an explosion, um, one of the foremen was telling the superintendent um, how many men were in the mine and what hadn't been accounted for. And the superintendent asked how many mules were in the mine. Mm -hmm. And that over time sort of evolved into the mules are um, like the companies take better care of the mules than right. they do the coal miners. Right. Because they can, they have to buy the mules, a coal miner will just show up. Right. Right. Exactly. Um, I wanted to show this picture too. Um, this building um, is still standing today. It's in Itman, which is in Wyoming County. Um, this building, I think, was built in 1923 to 1925. It was built by an Italian stonemason. Uh, it is the Inman Company store, and it is on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, it's currently sitting for sale. Hmm. Um, and so they're trying to sell it. I think that they're, they're trying to find someone to buy it uh, who will use it for historic purposes. So, But pretty much all of those houses are gone. It's just the store there along the main road down in um, uh, Wyoming County. This is this is really on my like, I wanna go see this place list. So, and then. Here we've got some mine guards. Yeah. Um, these were the folks who were in charge of um, enforcing company law. Um, these coal camps didn't have an elected government um, and they didn't have um, really a police force. They had these mine guards who would um they were ostensibly there to keep sabotage from happening but a lot of what their job boiled down to was intimidating miners if they complained and started talking about organizing a union and those intimidations could be threats um, they could be physical violence they could they would beat and sometimes even kill miners who were trying to organize a union um, but more often those threats came through firings and evictions. Um, if you were um, <clears throat> if you were trying to organize a union, you could very well lose your house yeah. and everything in it. Yeah. Um, and it was those mine guards who would um, carry out the evictions, just throw all your stuff out, throw you out. And if you were fired, you were put on a blacklist, um, which means that none of the other, other companies in the area would hire you. Absolutely. Well, and this picture is from Paint Creek, so we know this is early. Um, some of the earliest um, pushes to start and unionize is going to be in Paint Creek. And so the Baldwin Felts were from Bluefield, West Virginia, and so they came up on the train um, to Kanawha County, which is where Paint Creek is, um, to basically subdue the miners. Um, I also wanted to point out the tools of the trade. Yeah. Um, early on, this is what, what you had to have with you because everything was done by hand. And this is an auger, right? Yeah, that's a chest auger. Yeah, and so you would drill that into the coal and then you would load it with mm -hmm. dynamite and then you would light the dynamite and then it would break the coal into smaller pieces. Um, before you did any drilling though, you'd have to do what's called undercutting. Right. You would take a pick Pickaxe. and you would just cut a few inches so of the coal <laughs> seam. So, so it would fall down. But it would fall down once you out. left that's it out. Yeah. So you use this and this. And then, of course, you can't forget the miner's bucket. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is super important. And, and this, of course, ties to, you know, West Virginia's, like, most famous, most beloved food, the pepperoni roll, mm -hmm. when um, the Italian immigrants came to West Virginia and the husbands were going into the mines, they wanted something that was hardy, something that could last in these miners' buckets, and so they come up with a pepperoni roll to stick in this bucket, and so they could take it under underground, and it didn't have to be heated up. It could just be eaten as it was. And the buckets carried everything that a miner would need for the day: yeah. food, water. Yeah. And there's a layer right here, mm -hmm. right, with the water. Yeah. Yeah. And 
to signal a strike later on, um, you would have miners, um, you would have a, one miner dump out their bucket, and that was a signal to everyone else, dump your water out, we're done working for the day, and we're going on strike. That's um, powerful. Yeah. That's really powerful. All right, so let's dive into some strikes. Okay, so we're now moving on to talk about um, the first strikes that happened in the state of West Virginia, and that's the Paint Creek, Cabin Creek strikes that happened in Kanawha County. This is Eastern Kanawha County, like past where DuPont Chemical Plant is. Um, the kids that would have lived on Paint Creek, Cabin Creek, uh, nowadays they would have went to Riverside High School. And so this gives us um, a timeline of um, what happened during um, this warfare. All right, so we have 1912 here, and on the other wall here, we have 1913. Yeah, yeah. and so this is this is going to be the first time that Mother Jones comes to West Virginia, correct? Well, she had, she had come in in 1902 trying to organize the New River coal fields, um, but um, the miners there were too immiserated. Yeah. Um, they um, basically weren't really biting at the chance to right. organize their own union. Well, and they had been there for a while because mm -hmm. those those are going to be like the first southern coal fields is going to be that New River Gorge area, like places like Nuttleburg. Mm -hmm. um, so she comes back. She came back in 1912 and worked um, with the miners there supporting the strike and um, working to get more uh, miners involved in joining yeah. with the union. Yeah, and she was a fiery speaker, and they and they talk about you know the fact that she looked like this little old granny, but she had the mouth like a sailor. <laughs> yeah, and that was very much intentional. Like yeah. she <laughs> did really do a lot to cultivate her own like, uh, her brand, persona. Her Absolutely, she knew. Um, and like she was willing to go to bat for these miners too. Mm -hmm. She um, here she is after she was arrested um, right before she went on trial in Pratt. Um, during the mar one of the martial law phases, she was one of the people who was arrested and put on trial by court martial. Mm -hmm. And she refused to recognize the um, she re refused to recognize the court martial's authority because she was a civilian and um, she felt that her right to a trial by jury was um, not being recognized. Absolutely. And um, she was actually sentenced to prison in the West Virginia State Penitentiary in Moundsville. Um, ended up with a reduced sentence because partly because of um, she developed pneumonia, partly because of her age, and partly because you had people advocating for her release. Right. Right. Um, Absolutely. She was beloved. Yeah. Um. What else should we mention here? Probably. The moment that always sticks with me is the Bull Moose Special. Mm -hmm. And we have more about that over here, oh, too. Oh, perfect. Good. So we'll talk about that shortly because it's that's one of those moments of history that makes me sick to my stomach. And here we have a map of um, all of the... Um, all of the coal camps along Paint Creek and Cabin yeah. Creek. Yeah. And you can see some of the... Um, battles that took place yeah. as well. Um, you've got Cane Fork um, or es Eskdale. I struggle with the pronunciation it's of that one sometimes. Uh, you've got Mucklow and then Holly Grove up here. Yeah. So I have a very good friend of mine um, that I made this summer, um, but her family, this is where they're from. So we're going to, after after the first frost and the snakes go back underground, we're going to head out Red Warrior and Caperd. And her mom's going to go with us. Oh, wow. And so she's in her 80s, and she's going to give us all the history of this part of West Virginia. So stay tuned, folks. Now, somewhere out in Kanawha County, I'm not sure where, and I'm not sure if it's on, it's probably on private land, but um, you can still see, like, cement pillboxes oh, my gosh. where... Yeah. These mine guards would yeah. be stationed we'll, out in the woods. We'll ask her mom. If we find them, I'll let you know. Um, all right, let's talk a little bit about the Bull Moose Special. All right, so um, during the strike, evicted miners would live in um, tent colonies, living in tents kind of like this one. And um, 
it, they fin they functioned basically like their own little towns. It wasn't just miners; it was uh, women and children living yeah. there too. Yeah. And at one point, the um, sheriff of Kanawha County at the time, Quinn Morton, um, commissioned this armored train car called the Bull Moose Special um, to basically keep the coal moving out of Kanawha County. Mm -hmm. And um, on the night of February the 7th, 1913, um, he loaded up this train car with sheriff's deputies, mine guards, and there were at least a couple of Baldwin Feltz men present. And they um, rode through, um, turned their lights out um, as they passed by Holly Grove Camp, and just raked the entire area with machine gun fire. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they wounded or killed um, several people, including women and children. Yeah. And um, I mean, thank goodness they the miners. A lot of them knew that this was a possibility, mm -hmm. and so they had dug into the ground. Yeah. And so the tent, like the bot, the the floor of the tent was below ground, and so they could lay down and hopefully not get mm -hmm. shot. And part of the reason we know about all of this is the testimony of a woman named Maud Estep before the Senate's subcommittee investigating all of this. Um, she testified before the United States Senate um, that her husband, um, Francesco, had um, heard the gunfire and took, picked up his rifle and went to protect his family. She had a young children... Uh, a young child and had um, one on the way at the time oh my gosh. and um, he was killed in, during this and her testimony helped to actually get at least some public awareness about this and bring it to the right. attention of the U.S. Senate. Right. A lot of this history might seem like new history to you. This is what we call hidden history mm -hmm. when, when we're fighting to save history. This is the kind of history that we're fighting to save because this is history that people in power, people who own big companies, they don't want this story to be told, and right. it hasn't been told. Um, I was not to taught the story of the mine wars when I was a West Virginia history student. Um, this was whitewashed out of our West Virginia history textbooks. And so that's one of the main reasons this museum exists is to take this from being hidden history mm -hmm. to being history that empowers people. Yeah, and a point that I want to make too about um, the Holly Grove massacre, um, the women didn't just take this lying down. Right. Um, I think years later, Maud Estep admitted to picking up her husband's rifle and firing back at the train. Right. And Sarah Blizzard here uh, was one of the women who organized um, sabotage raids on the rail lines. They used these big pry bars, um, stuff like what you see here to rip the tracks up and roll them down towards um, the creek bank. And they basically shut down the rail line yeah. down Cabin Creek. Yeah, women women have always played a central role um, in strikes. I know in our own community where we live in Jackson County, um, our aluminum plant was on strike for two and a half years. And so the men would be on the picket line and the women, the way that they fought back is they would get in their cars and they would drive completely on the road on both sides of the plant so nobody could get in or out of the plant because they had the, the road totally congested with cars. And they did that day after day after day to keep scabs from getting in or out of the plant. Women did that in my, my neck of the woods during the Pittston strike in 1989 and 1990. Yeah, this was 19... Um, in 1992 right. where our strike was yeah so it's women it's just a long history of of women resisting as well as men resisting and think about all this all the care work that they did too oh my gosh and yeah. working under circumstances like they're in these tent colonies um that are rife with disease they're mm -hmm. not really well protected from the elements um the women of these movements had steel backbones oh they gosh. had to well, these movements would have never been successful right. if it hadn't been for women. Absolutely. Especially people like Sarah Blizzard. You know, you just think about her and, you know, her fighting back and all the women who fought back with her. I love this. I didn't realize how historical this sign was 
um, the first time that I saw it. But this is the District 17 UMWA sign. I mean, look at, look at that. <laughs> I mean, that historical photo just gives me goosebumps to think about Fred Mooney and Frank Keeney standing in front of that sign um, as leaders of the UMWA who are, you know, standing in solidarity with these miners. I want to show too. Um, we've got Dan Ching here. Oh yes. Um, he was nicknamed Few Clothes. Yeah. Um, and of course, that nickname probably came from he didn't really travel with anything but the clothes on his back. Mm -hmm. um, but Dan Chain was this um, really militant unionist. He was really instrumental to. Um, getting African American miners to organize with the union. Absolutely. Um, a lot of African Americans were brought up during these strikes to work as scabs. Mm -hmm. They didn't usually know that they were being brought in as scab labor, but he would um, go in and tell them what was going on and recruit them to join the union. Right. And Chain in particular was a member of um, what's called the Dirty Eleven essentially this commando unit that worked as self-defense for the miners. Um, they would, um, they were these men who weren't afraid to get their hands dirty right. and actually retaliate against Baldwin Feltz raids. Absolutely. Isn't Gene Joel Jones's character yeah. in, in the movie um, Mate One based on yeah, Dan James Earl, James Earl Jones's character in the movie Mate One is directly based off of Dan Chain. Yeah. Um, he's about eight years um, out of time, but um, yeah. that character is based on yeah. a real person. Yeah, and if you've not seen the movie Mate One, um, which is all about the buildup uh, to the um, Mate One massacre, the battle of Mate One, you need to see it. Um, it is one of the best movies, in my opinion, ever made. Um, John Sayles did it, mm -hmm. and, and you've got some great actors who are in it, Chris Cooper, Chris Cooper and Mary did, McDonald. Oh my gosh, I love Mary McDonald. I'm, I'm a Battlestar Galactica fan, and I love Mary McDonald. And um, uh, also James Earl Jones. James Earl Jones. And then um, um, who, Will Oldham plays yes. Danny. Uh, oh, he's so good. He is um, also a folk singer. Yes. Uh, he's recorded several Bonnie different Prince albums. Billy. Yeah. If you've ever heard of Bonnie Prince Billy. He's so good. He plays the son. Oh my gosh, he's so good. And then um, the guy that plays the president of Marshall University that plays Sid. Um, David Strahan. David Strahan it is an all-star cast. Um, they actually did not film the movie here in Mate One. They filmed it um, down in um, Thurman. Thurman, yeah. And it is, oh my heart. If you've not seen it, you need to see it. So just wanted to throw that out there. Okay, let's keep on moving because I could talk all day. We could talk all day. So this is a very important wall because it talks about the fact that um, a war is going to happen. <laughs> um, and that war is World War One. And if you know anything about West Virginia, um, West Virginia always answers the call when war happens. And um, statistically, we answer that call at a much higher percentage than pretty much anywhere else in the United States. And so a lot of these men that work in the mines are going to leave the mines during World War I and they're going to go off and fight for the United States in World War I. And so here's some of the posters. So they're going to trade the hat for the helmet. And World War I is a watershed moment in a several, several oh, yes. different ways um, within the context of the mine wars, too. Um, you have the Union negotiating a really good contract that miners in southern West Virginia don't get to enjoy the benefits exactly. of. Um, and you have the federal government um, sort of serving as this mediator and um, really improving working, working conditions across the board. Right. But at the same time, these, just, these guys that yeah. go off get empowered. They they're yeah. they're fighting for their country. They see what rights they have as individuals, and so when they come home, they don't want to come home and feel powerless. Right. They want to feel empowered, like they feel as soldiers in the U.S. Army. Yeah, a lot of the folks who will go on to fight at the Battle of Blair Mountain, they served as doughboys. They served yeah. with the American Expeditionary um, Force. And they were fighting here at Blair Mountain 
for the same rights that they were fighting for in the trenches in France. Absolutely. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. So this wall gives us a good timeline of what's happening after Paint Creek. And, and then into World War II, World War One, um, the United States enters uh, World War One in April of 1917. So right here, this contract had just been signed for unionized miners, and then here's what happens um, in May. And so the we, April is when we go to war, and then by May, coal miners. And operators agree not to strike while the war is happening because they need coal for the war effort to produce everything, pretty mm -hmm. much. Um, so you can see here the timeline where we are. And then, of course, um, World War One ends right here on November the 11th of 1918. And so um, you're going to see these coal miners coming home. And then that starts what we get into um, in 1919, I talked about this earlier that, um, about the state police being mm -hmm. formed basically, um, because of the, the strike that's happening yeah. in, in the coal fields. Also important to note, because it's World War One, one of the things that happens is we go from an imperialist Russia to a Soviet Union. And so there's a huge red scare, um, at the end of World War One. That's going to happen all through the 1920s. We have another Red Scare, of course, in the 1950s. But this Red Scare ties into unionism yeah. big time because people um, try to say that all of the unionists are socialists and communists. And um, the Socialist Party was very popular among the miners yeah. in Pink Creek. Absolutely. Creek. Well, because it's about people. Yeah. <laughs> you, you get it. It's not about, you know, a party enabling and, and fueling corporations and fat mm -hmm. cats. It's about standing for people. So this is the context of where we are <coughs> that... We're ending World War One. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's when we get into the um, into the mom wars. And then it also mentions here about John L. Lewis calling for a nationwide coal strike in November of 1919, and we're going to see 50,000 West Virginia coal miners walk out. And so that next month, the miners gain a 14% wage increase and end the strike. However, because the Southern coal fields are not unionized or organized. We're not going to see any of those miners get any of the benefit from that contract. Mm -hmm. All right. So by 1920, we have um, the UNWA really um, starting to focus on organizing Logan, McDowell, and Mingo counties. And the way they announced this is in January of 1920, um, January 30th, um, John L. Lewis and Frank Caney hold a massive rally in Bluefield, West Virginia just down the street from the Baldwin Feltz Detective Agency's headquarters. <laughs> and they, they say they're going to unionize all three of those um, southern West Virginia counties. Um, and this really kicks off the big surge in organizing, and it really sort of kicks off the um, Mingo County strikes. Um, on April 26th, um, just about four months after um, Lewis and Keeney declare their intentions, Fred Mooney comes down to um, Mingo County and holds a massive union rally in Williamson and Matewan. And you have miners um, joining the union by the hundreds. Right. And remember, like, Williamson and Matewan are, are independent uh -huh. towns. They're not coal mine towns. That's why the the union can freely operate yeah. in these places. Um, the problem you have, though, is um, the companies by this point are using spies, mm -hmm. and they're with it. They're in the middle of the crowd. They're taking names. They know Absolutely. all the people who are signing their union cards. And the very next day, every man who signed a union card was fired. And part of the justification for that is these things right here. These are called yellow dog contracts, if yeah. you want to zoom in on that. Yeah, you definitely want to zoom in on this. Um, so you first start seeing these contracts pop up around 1907. Um, in 1917, the S Supreme Court of the United States upheld their use. And what these contracts basically say is uh, 
if you sign it, um, you promise not to join a union, either the United Mine Workers or the Industrial Workers of the World. And if you do join either of those organizations, if you do organize a union, that's grounds for termination. Right. Now, the issue becomes the you have to sign one of these contracts to be able to actually work. Right. And a lot of the stuff that we're seeing during this period in southern West Virginia, um, be it the red flag law, um, the, these um, yellow dog contracts, a lot of these... Um, a lot of these things go directly against the First Amendment, talking about freedom of speech, free right. association. Right. So what a lot of these miners learn from World War One and what they um, start fighting for, and what they've been fighting for this entire time, is their constitutional rights. Right. Um, it's about working get conditions, to be sure. For sure. But it is also about their right to the U.S. citizen. Right. Well, and what we call fundamental rights. Yeah. These are these are what we talk about in school about being your inalienable rights. These rights that all people, fundamental rights that all people are born with as human beings. And if you are working in a coal mine and you're having those basic human rights being denied to you, then you know it's up to your employer to change. Mm -hmm. Not up for you to change. For your employer to yeah, change. Yeah, and no individual worker is gonna. Um, be able to force their employer to change these policies absolutely. on their own. And that's why these companies are so scared of the union. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because they're seeing their workers in power. Mm -hmm. They want to keep their workers where they can control their workers. So the Mingo strike really gets rolling in the spring of 1920. And in Matewan, they do have um, a really friendly town government. Uh, Mayor Cabell Tusterman and Police Chief Sid Hatfield um, were very pro minor. Yeah. And um, Sid had been a minor himself for a little bit. Yeah. Um, but Matewan is one of the few places in southern West Virginia where union men can operate freely. Right. Um, which is a real parallel to what's going on in Logan County, which we'll right. get into it here in a little bit, right. but um, there's interesting comparisons that you can draw there. The total opposites. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And right here is a some newsreel footage of Sid Hatfield. There he is. And you can see Sid smiling Sid with, with his gold teeth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. During this time, he really sort of became a folk hero, um, Smiling Sid or Two Gun Sid, because he was known to carry a pair of revolvers with him. Yeah. I mean, he was young. What, 26, 27 when he was shot? Yeah, he, was, um, he wasn't even 30. Yeah. Yeah, and Ed Chambers was 20, 21. Ed was 23 years old. Yeah, I mean, they were just babies. Babies. So... So on the one side you have Sid Hatfield, and the, on the other hand side you have the Baldwin Phelps Detective Agency. Right, which is what we're going to talk mm -hmm. about now. So Baldwin Phelps were the hired gun thugs that the um, companies would bring in when the normal mine guards weren't cutting it. These were the, the, the big spies. These were the people who um, were not afraid to kill for the company. Right. Um, and on May the 19th, 1920, you have a group of about 13 Baldwin Phelps men roll into town, including Albert and Lee Phelps, the brothers of Thomas Phelps, um, who was the um, one of the heads of the Baldwin Phelps agency. Yeah. And they say they've come into town to carry out these evictions um, up in the coal camps. Right. And... Testerman and Hatfield challenge them, saying that these um, writs of eviction aren't legit. You'll right. have to go up to Charleston to get one. Right. And Again, it's about your constitutional yep. rights. You can't just throw somebody out of their house. And they also produce a warrant for Sid's arrest if he decides he's going to get in the way. Right. Um, so they go up to the coal camps and um, they know they're up there, but over the course of the day, 
um, the miners and Sid and the mayor have time to sort of prepare for what's coming next. Right. They know they're here for these evictions, and May 19th is really important, too, because that's Union Relief Day. Uh, so Maitlon yeah. was full of full people. Full of people. Um, people were, um, miners were coming in to get their supplies for, like, strike relief. Right. Um, Instead of, like, today, when when unions are on strike, you mm -hmm. get money out of the strike fund. They were handing out they food, were handing out tents, food. blankets. Yeah, exactly. Instead of giving them cash, they were handing out the things that they needed to be able to survive on the strike. So, Baldwin Feltz men come back into town um, at about 4 p.m. It's drizzling a little bit of rain and they're on the platform waiting for the 515 train back to Bluefield and Sid and Mayor Testerman confront them again um, directly confronting Albert and Lee Feltz um, the other guys are standing up on the platform with um, their guns put away and some heated words are exchanged and all of a sudden a shot rings out um, within about two minutes um, this is not a very long gunfight at all um, 10 baldwin feltz men including both of the feltz brothers who were there were killed yeah. um, the mayor was fatally wounded and two miners were also dead yeah. and in the short term this was a huge morale boost to the strikers because they had fought back. They'd been pushed so far and they were part of a story that I think gets um, looked over is how much the miners tried to avoid any sort of violent right. confrontation. Right. Um, well, they, striking is a last yeah. resort. And violence is the last resort when you're striking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what we finally start to see around 1920 especially is things are getting to the point where the miners really don't have any other options but to take up arms. Right. Um, so, in the months after um, the Battle of Maitland, which um, happened right outside of this window over yeah. by the railroad tracks. Right over there, we, were, we have a, a video that shows that, including the bullets mm -hmm. that are still in the walls. So we're right here, ground zero. And, for example, this building right here that you see the picture of, that's right here. We can see it out the window at this moment. So much history. I mean, that's perfect with the window. So in the months afterward, um, you have a trial in Williamson. Um, Sid and about... Um, 14 other men were put on trial for um, murder, all sorts of different charges. Um, and a witness who was a distant relation of Sid Hatfield named um, Ants, um, also related to yeah. uh, Devil Ants, yep. um, he turned up dead in January of 1921. Um, so there's some questions about what really happened to him, too. But through um, January into March, um, you have this really sensational murder trial happening in Williamson. And it includes all sorts of courtroom drama. Um, C.E. Lively, a restaurateur who um, had offered up his restaurant as basically the UMW's local headquarters. Yeah testified against the miners and revealed himself to be a Baldwin Feltz agent. Yeah. And he had been a Baldwin Feltz agent for a long time. He yeah. had uh, worked for them during Paint and Cabin Creek. Um, he had actually gone to Colorado and um, worked as a Baldwin Feltz agent during the strike that also included the Ludlow Massacre in 1913-1914. Yeah. Um, and he started testifying all of this um, stuff about Sid um, planning to um, murder Testerman himself to get right. at um, Mayor Testerman's wife, Jessie. 
which is not true, of right. course. But he heard so many conversations that were said in confidence. Mm -hmm. They they trusted him. He was supposed to be an ally, and he ends up being the Judas of this story. Yeah. So, yeah. He, by the way, look at this photo of Sid. Um, this is Sid and his wife, Jessie. By the way, note Testerman Hatfield. She was married to Cabell Testerman, the mayor. Mm -hmm. And then after the mayor dies, she goes and marries Sid. Um, and here's Ed Chambers. Yeah. So it's thought that Jessie and Sid got married as Cabell's dying wish. Right. Um, he wanted Jesse and um, the <coughs> child to be well taken care right. of. Right. Um, and Sid and Jesse were actually arrested in Huntington for um, indecency because they yeah. were sharing a hotel room. Yeah. But they were in Huntington to get married. Right. Um, but, That's a fun part of yeah. the story. <laughs> but Thomas Feltz, um, after the after his brothers died. Um, he basically swore revenge out on Sid Hatfield, right. and he starts spreading all these rumors about um, how Sid killed the mayor to get to Jesse, basically trying to drag Sid's name through the mud. Yeah, yeah, so absolutely. So, on March 20th of 1921, all 14 defendants are acquitted, and Phelps basically figures out that if he's going to get back at Sid, it's not going to be in a court of law. Right. So he manages to get some charges trumped up in McDowell County. Yeah. And Sid and Ed Chambers have to go there for their arraignment. Yeah. And it's pretty obvious that it's a trap. So they try to take all these precautions to make sure that they're safe. Um, they... Um, get promises from McDowell County's sheriff that um, they'll have safe conduct to and from Welch. And um, for whatever reason, on the morning of August 1st, the sheriff is out of town that day. But they get into Welch, they meet their um, sheriff's deputy escort, and Sid and Ed both brought their wives with them. And they left their guns in the room. Um, they went down to have breakfast. Um, they noticed C. Lively was there and had some pretty tense words with him, but they went about their day. And as they're walking up the steps to the courthouse, the sheriff's deputy steps aside. C. E. Lively and about six other men just pop out and riddled. Sid and Ed Chambers with bullets. Yeah. Um, that line about they, they struck him like down like a dog. Yeah. Just in broad daylight. In broad daylight on the courthouse steps. And during the trial, they were acquitted because of a lack of witnesses. Yeah. Yeah. So this picture, this is um, of the burial of Sid and Ed. Um, across the river in Buskirk, Kentucky, mm -hmm. um, on August the 4th, 1921. And thousands of people turned out for this funeral, correct? Mm hmm I mean, you can just see all the people in here. Here's the widow. I mean, imagine to be twice widowed and you're, you're not even 30. Yeah. yeah. And while all this is going on, too, the strike is getting worse. Um, you have martial law declared and... You have a few hundred miners arrested by these um, community defense leagues that are essentially the middle class in Mingo County who right. stand to benefit from a lack of a union. They're the right. people who are making a profit off of um, the coal industry here. Yeah. So all of these miners are being held in Williamson without trial. And that basically turns the entire situation into a powder keg yeah. and Sid's assassination really sets the entire thing off. Absolutely. You have a massive rally in Charleston and Frank Keeney and Fred Mooney demand to see the governor to get him to release the miners who are being held um, unconstitutionally in right. w Williamson. And Governor Ephraim Morgan refuses to even see them. Right. 
You gotta remember, everyone in positions of power in West Virginia are they're in the pocket of the cold. It was a corporate police state. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, of course, we've talked about two sheriffs. I mean, Don Chafin's the total opposite of Sid. Mm -hmm. And he he's he's in the pocket of the coal companies. Yeah, so but Don, our governors were our, yep. our governors every 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 level of power when it came to political officials, they they were in the pockets of coal companies. So to give you a pers some uh, perspective, Don Chafin had about three hundred deputies, and in 1921, his personal net worth was about five million dollars. You don't make that kind of money being a sheriff of a small rural county. No, and he's like less than thirty years old at the mm -hmm. time. I mean, in in he was paid thousands of dollars a month by these coal operators yeah, to keep the peace. And he wasn't afraid to murder union organizers or have Absolutely. his goons murder them. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Here's a picture. This is from um, when Don Chafin was. Um, well, 17, he would be not sheriff at the moment. I think his father-in-law was sheriff then, um, but he is going to be one of these deputies. And he acted as de facto sheriff when his father-in-law was um, sheriff of Logan mm -hmm. County. And then he got reelected sheriff in 1920. So so by August 7th at um, Charleston, Frank Keeney, um, after the governor won't see them, tells the miners who are assembled there, to go home, arm themselves, and wait for orders. Um, he says the only way that you're going to win your freedoms is with a high-powered rifle. Right. Right. Remember, these are people that know how to use guns because they're from West Virginia, mm -hmm. and they've just fought in World War One. Yeah. Um, so over the course of um, August, you have these miners starting to assemble, and um, they're going to march on Williamson, and and um, liberate their brothers themselves. And I love this quote here from Reverend John Wilburn. Right. The time has come for me to lay down my Bible and pick up my rifle and fight for my rights. Absolutely. So the miners, <coughs> the miners assembled in Kanawha County and they had to march through Boone County and Logan County to get to Mingo. So right. they knew um, what they were going to end up running into. Right. Um, they commandeered trains. They walked on foot. Yeah. Um, some had cars. Yeah. Um, and leadership within the UMWA slowly starts to realize that this thing's probably going to spiral out of control. And probably end in disaster. Yeah. And Mother Jones actually came to Marmette um, at the beginning of the march, um, it's way up. It's not, actually not even on this mark, it's, on this map. Um, it's along the Kanawha River on the other side of the river from what's DuPont Chemical Plant today. So, so Mother Jones comes to Marmette and she produces what she says is a telegraph from President Warren Harding. And it says that he is going to mediate the situation with the coal companies if the miners all go home. Right. And when Frank Keeney asks to see the telegraph, she gets a really sort of um, standoffish about it, won't let him see it. And Frank says that it's a, it's a forgery. She's trying yeah. to double cross us. Yeah. And you have to imagine how heartbreaking this had to have been for Mother Jones. Um, she had known Frank Keeney since the New River strike right. um, when she went into a pool hall and told him to stop playing pool and start educating himself for the right. struggle to come. Right. Um, she referred to the miners as her boys. Her boys. Because she didn't have children of her own. Mm. Well, well, she did, but they died. Yeah, they died in the yellow fever yeah. epidemic in 1867. Yeah, in St. Louis. Uh, Memphis. Memphis, that's right. Yep. Um, so that was the last time that... Um, that Mother Jones was ever seen in West Virginia. Yeah. Um, she maintained her activism, but she would never come back to West Virginia again. Right. Um, John L. Lewis tried to urge them to turn back. Um, eventually, Frank Keeney and Fred Mooney um, had to sneak off to Ohio to, um, as the situation got further and further out of control. Um, 
So you have the guy who eventually becomes known as the Miners General, Bill Blizzard. Right. He's the main UNWA leadership on the ground. And, and I, they, they come, Keeney and Mooney come to Boone County, correct? Yeah. And they give the big speech at, at Madison and Danville. Mm -hmm. Um, and basically say this is this you're gonna fail. Yeah, and try to get them to quit right and they don't yeah and like There were several points at which the miners did um, Almost turn back, but you'd have raids by the West Virginia State Police and you'd have raids by Don Chafin and yeah. his sheriff's deputies Yeah, um, they'd kill or maim other miners and it would just stoke the fire even more. Yeah, absolutely I mean, look at the quote from Don Chafin, kill all the rednecks you can. So this army that we're talking about of miners, uh, it's, they, they don't have a uniform, but they have the red mm -hmm. bandanas. And that's, that's an important thing to talk about when we talk about symbols. Uh, the term redneck yeah. refers to that red bandanas that the miners wore. So this is how they were able to denote who was part of the miners army versus who was you know, on the other side. Yeah, and that was really useful for this miners' army too, because you have people of all sorts of diverse oh, um, and ethnic backgrounds. You have about twenty to twenty-five percent of the miners who marched on Blair Mountain um, were African American. Mm -hmm. You have a large contingent of immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe who. Right may not necessarily speak English, so they needed a way to quickly identify each, each other. other. Well, and that's important. We talk about this a lot. West Virginia is not a monolith. Mm -hmm. Appalachia is not a monolith. And and a great deal of diversity existed. And this, this is kind of in conflict with things yeah. that you see elsewhere in history. Here you have people of all diverse backgrounds working together, working in coal mines together, um, and working to create this union together. Right, and it's not just men who were marching on Blair Mountain either. You have women serving as nurses on the battlefield. Right. And they continue to do all of their other roles. Um, they, they carry meals up to the miners who are on the front lines. Um, you have um, at least one woman who's working as a reporter and claims she got shot in the hand. Her name is Mildred Morris. Oh, yeah. And the UMWA actually published her account of Blair Mountain in the United Mine Workers Journal. Right. Um, so this is a massive, massive thing that's happening. Right. And um, it takes, it really does start to spiral out of control. Um, the Logan County deputies eventually commandeer a plane and they start dropping bombs. Yeah. They've got a replica of one of the bombs that got dropped out of a civilian plane. We talked about this in our um, Don Chafin video about how he uh, got local folks to make bombs. And another little bit of context that um, I think is related um, this is just months after the Tulsa Race Massacre, Absolutely. where um, a white mob commandeered a civilian aircraft and bombed a very wealthy black, black neighborhood yeah. in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Absolutely. And and you can't think about any of these things in history like they're in a vacuum. They're yeah. all interrelated. Yeah, they're all these, connected. They're all connected because people are going through the same things and thinking the same things all over the country when it comes to race, when it comes to politics, when it comes to your rights. And mm -hmm. so it's all interconnected. So these are some of the shell casings that they've found up on Blair Mountain mm -hmm. in Logan County. Yeah, so we base the shells that are included in each case based on which side of the lines they were found oh, on. Oh, that's interesting. So this is, this is going to be your sheriff's deputies, and okay. Uh, so you see some forty-five ACP slugs. Yeah. Um, they would have come out of something like a Thompson gun. Oh, uh, okay. Like this is full-scale war. They're not just using rifles. They're or using, pistols. They're using Tommy guns. Tommy guns, um, machine guns too. Um, one of our um, the donors of our main collections. Um, Kenny King actually brought in um, another group of shells or slugs that were 
embedded in Ooh, wood just the other day. Look at that. Look at that. My gosh. That's amazing. So what finally convinced the miners to put down their arms was the arrival of federal troops. Um, you had some military brass on, on the ground there. Um, pretty early on, you have General Harry Bandholtz, um, who was um, a war hero from the Philippine War in the early 1900s and from the um, Great War, World War I. And it was ultimately going to be his call about whether or not U.S. troops would be deployed. But you've also got um, really one of the guys you can sort of consider to be the father of the Air Force, mm -hmm. even though the USAF doesn't come into being until after World War II, but you've got Billy Mitchell. Um, he flies in to Charleston, to right? Charleston yeah. with a, a wing of these really like world primitive World War I era bombers. Yeah. And he's really been lobbying within the War Department about the uses of aerial power um, to military applications. Right. So he sees this as a chance to demonstrate how air power can be used right. to um, put down a civil insurrection. Right. Um, and it's his quote there is really kind of morbid too yeah you understand we wouldn't try to kill these people at first we'd drop tear gas all over the place and if they refused to disperse then we'd open up with artillery and everything well i mean these guys have just been in the trenches in europe yeah a lot of um a lot of the miners actually wore their service uniforms mm -hmm. um, we've got a um, springfield up there that was actually built back in World War II, but they would have carried their service rifles. Right, absolutely. Well, and this Van Holtz quote too, these are your, he says this to Frank Keeney and Fred Mooney, these are your people, I'm gonna give you a chance to say, save them, and if you cannot turn them back, we're gonna snuff this out. This will never do. There are several million unemployed in this country now, and this thing might assume proportions that might be difficult to handle. We've talked about this. Mm -hmm. um, and on other videos about the fact that um, West Virginia after World War One, we're going to see the Great Depression starts very early here. Yeah, you never you never see in West Virginia unless you're a coal operator or a politician or sort of really upper middle class. You never see any of the like the Roaring Twenties. Oh no, um, no. post war prosperity. Absolutely not. Um, Just like the nineteen fifties. They were boom all over the country, all over the United States, but not in West Virginia because mm -hmm. we see the coal mines, coal, coal companies either shutting down or laying off um, hundreds or thousands of workers. So, in West Virginia, these times that are considered high moments in American history don't translate to West Virginia, uh, and the 1920s is is mm -hmm. a perfect example of that because and the coal there's not the demand for coal. And that quote from Van Holtz. Um, I think that really illustrates the sort of the tenor in America at that point. Um, yeah. You have lots of labor, labor unrest that has been going on for the past couple of years and carried on um, over to like the Red Scare too. Like there are legitimate fears that this is going to spark like a Russian revolution Absolutely. type situation. Yeah, cultural revolution. Absolutely. I would agree with that wholeheartedly. But the reason that the miners lay down their arms after the U.S. military shows up, so many of them had fought alongside right. some of these people, and they the miners did not see themselves as fighting against the United States. They yeah. saw themselves as patriots fighting for their constitutional Absolutely. rights and their fundamental liberties. Absolutely. It's, it reminds me of like Shays' Rebellion mm -hmm. when we talk about after the revolution, these were revolutionary war soldiers. They said, we're fighting for what we fought for in the revolution. We're just continuing that tradition. Yeah. This is what you taught us, just like with World War I. We're just continuing what, what we learned in the trenches, you know, in France. Yeah. So, as the miners go home, 
the strike still continues. You have raids on tent colonies still um, happening. And then you start seeing the indictments. Um, mm -hmm. Somewhere around 500 miners ended up being indicted for um, charges ranging from destruction of private property all the way up to treason. Right. And the miners who were being put on trial for treason were taken up to the jail in um, Jefferson County in Charlestown. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. The same jail or the same courthouse where um, John, John Brown, Brown was, was tried, tried for treason. treason. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, that was thought through. Mm -hmm. I mean, that had to have been thought through. The right. fact that you're trying Frank Keeney in the same in the same courtroom that you tried John Brown for treason against yeah. Virginia. And basically the operators have learned as well that um, they were never going to get a fair trial. In, or oh. What they saw as a, fair, a fair trial, trial. I want to say. Um, they yeah. weren't going to get the verdict that they wanted in southern West Virginia. Right. Because the, the sentiment and pu public opinion and sentiment mm -hmm. was with the miners. Right. Absolutely. And... Throughout the trial, you have these accounts coming up about how um, the mi the miners got bombed. You have the terrible, terrible conditions in the coal camps coming to light. Right. And m pretty much all of the really severe charges are dropped. Yeah. Um, so, some miners did spend some time in prison. Um, the last one to serve time was paroled in 1925. So not very long. Mm -hmm. At but all. in the short term, the Battle of Blair Mountain was a devastating defeat for the Union. Right. Um, Union membership dwindled um, throughout the rest of the decade. Right. Um, I think it actually says um, by July of 1928, um, there were fewer than a thousand Union miners yes. left in West Virginia. I mean, all of West Virginia, and that includes the the northern coal field, like Marion mm -hmm. and uh, Monongalia counties. Compare um, plus, that to the ten thousand who marched on Blair Mountain. Right, right, absolutely. Well, and again, a lot of these miners were losing their jobs as we get further in the nineteen twenties mm -hmm. because uh, the demand for coal just gets less and less. Right. Yeah. And. It really takes the New Deal after oh, yeah. um, Franklin Roosevelt gets elected for um, the miners to actually get the victory that they've been fighting for for so long. Well, and that's part of why I think this history is buried is because mm -hmm. they didn't win the Battle of Blair Mountain. The Union does dwindle off. It's going to take federal legislation um, to um, give people the right to unionize. And there's been so much coal company propaganda. Oh, absolutely. Um, like over here we have facts about Don Chafin. The incomparable Don Chafin, or as I call him, the infamous Don Chafin. Yeah, he was basically cast as the hero of all of this. Right. Um, and like he's still kind of looked on in a hero, as a hero by some people in Logan County. Uh, Not this girl. Of course. <laughs> um, but that's that's what we're combating here. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're combating generations of revisit, your revisionist history um, that doesn't take into account the people in which um, I'm looking for, the everyday people. Everyday yeah. people, everyday lives, like what would benefit them, which was unionization. And some of the, the attempts to like literally erase that history are what our museum came out of. Absolutely. Uh, that takes well, us to the 2011 um, March on Blair Mountain. I mean, this is, this is a real deal, folks, that folks that wanted to erase our history just in the last, what, you said 2011? Yeah. Um, so Blair Mountain, there was this push and effort to get Blair Mountain put on the National Register of Historic Places. Yep. And it was zoned for surface mining. Yeah. So um, a bunch of coal operators, um, including Don Chapin, or not Don Chapin, Don Blankenship. Yes. Um, really fought to get it delisted. Yes. Um, so they could mine it. So they could take the battlefield and turn it into a, a strip mine. And 
it was actually taken off um, the list for, and that's what led to the um, June 4th through 11th march on Blair Mountain absolutely um, so I think it was taken off the list in 2009 yeah. and then they put it back on in 20, 2018 yeah 2018 so and this is your political the people that have been elected politicians that allowed this to be to happen Absolutely. Well, I mean, there's still no monument or marker, really, at Blair. There's a, there's a sign. Mm -hmm. There's there's one of the West Virginia highway markers. That's it. And that is one of the things that we're fighting for. We're trying to get, um, I guess, in the long term, um, we're trying to get at least part of the battlefield set up as a national monument. And it needs to be. So, as of right now, the museum has established memorials or monuments mm -hmm. at Marmette Clothier, and Clothier. Marmette. Yeah. 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 And so, the goal is to build a monument at Blair. Because there's nothing at Blair except for one of the highway markers. So. It's really a blink and you'll miss it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, again, this story is still, people are still trying to hide this history. That's why it's so important that we have these kinds of discussions and you come to see places like the Mind Wars Museum and that you patronize organizations that are doing such good work um, like the Mind Wars Museum. I love that Mother Jones quote. She says, we have fought together, we have marched together, but I can see victory in the heavens for you. She's awesome. So thank you for joining us at the West Virginia Mind Wars Museum. Um, I hope you learned a lot today, and huge thanks to Lloyd um, for all of his expertise and sharing all of this valuable information. Thank you for having me. Oh, glad to be, glad. This was awesome. This was so much fun. Thanks, y'all, for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe to West Virginia History with Mrs. B on both Facebook and YouTube.